Hey everyone, this is John Finnick with the Fennec Commodities Report, and with me today is Don Durrett, founder of goldstockdata.com. Great name for this market. And uh, we've got Jose Garcia on deck uh, coming up in about 15 minutes from SilverX, the CEO there, uh, who I had the opportunity to meet with in Toronto last week and uh, thought it would be timely to get him back onto the show. We haven't had him on since last year, and uh, there's been a lot of positive things happening there. So welcome, Don. Hey, John. Let's, let's do another interview. You got it. So a lot of good stuff has happened since we last sat down. We had that breakout March 1st in the sector. Um, good follow through on gold last week. Uh, decent day Monday, little bad day yesterday in the CPI read, and then another very strong day today. Uh, but what was different about today was that silver cranked and uh, you and I have both been saying we wanted to see silver start moving before we got too excited about this rally. So could you give us our, your thoughts, please? Yeah, um, today we only have about 15 minutes to talk about macro. We could easily talk an hour. Um, there's oh, yeah. definitely a lot going on right now because we've had this move in gold. You know, we're up to, you know, 2171. It's the last number I saw. Silver almost got to $25 today spot, probably is 25 futures, uh, 24.9 on spot the last I checked, and the hui uh, climbed over 230. Now, all weekend long, you know, I was basically kind of a skeptic because all, you know, it's amazing. All of the big TA guys are all saying, you know, gold's breaking out here. And I don't see, you know, the fundamental reason for it to break out you know, a lot of the TA guys say it's all it's all there. It's all you know, all the data is in the in the numbers, in the charts. But you know, we've seen this these false breakouts over and over again. You know, silver. You know, even though silver's at 2171, don't get so excited about the actual price because if you look at inflation and money printing, I mean, if you look at rent, for instance, you know, I saw this guy yesterday and he was talking about he has 10,000 tenants. And he, he basically keeps the numbers and, and rent has doubled since 2008, um, you know, in the standard of living. So, you know, in theory, gold should, you know, double as well. Um, so, you know, even though 21, you know, it's it's it looks like it's a real exciting number, but in actuality, you know, it's kind of an inflated number because all this money printing. And the bottom line is we're investing for gold and silver mining stocks and those guys haven't really moved yet. Some guy today told me that his mining stocks are down 90 percent. And I would say that, you know, most mining stocks are down 50 percent from their all time highs or more. And we haven't had a move in the miners. And so, you know, I just remain a skeptic here thinking, you know, for me, when gold runs, the miners participate and they're not yet. I mean, yeah, I mean, they had a bit of a move today, but because silver went up 90 cents. But until we see you know, some of this price action in the miners and price action in the silver. And the other thing I want to see, which I think is really important, is the fear trade. So, I mean, if you go back to the last two runs, it was 1970 to, two, to 1971 to 1980, basically a 10-year run in gold and silver. Well, we had uncertainty in that period. That's when the U.S. lost, you know, it's basically it's economic strength where it was a mercantilistic economy from 1945 till 1970. She had big time un uncertainty in the 70s and gold did great in a period of uncertainty. Then you had another 10 year run from 2001 to 2011. And that was also a period of uncertainty. You had the dot com bubble bust. Then you had 9-11 hit. Then you had the great financial crisis. You had all this debt. Run, right. So those were uncertainty slash fear trades that lasted a decade. Well, fear is missing right now. So I'm basically I'm basically on the fence saying, wait, 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 until we actually see, you know, confirmation in silver, I want to get to twenty six dollars. Right. And the hooey, I want to get above two fifty and especially I want to get above two seventy five. And then I want to see the fear trade kick in. Now, these are the things I want to check off the list before I basically say, OK, we're off to the races here. Um, you know, we can start thinking about our targets, our goals, what we want to achieve, but we're not there yet, you know. And so all this talk about goals breaking out, goals breaking out. I'm basically saying big, we're 2100, 2150. I'm saying big whoop. That's not it, guys. That's not the, 
we got some more check boxes to go here. So I'll mm -hmm. let you throw in some comments. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. I think one thing of encouragement though for, for clients and listeners is that we have a goal price that is at a new all time high, right? I mean, that is not just a one day blip like we saw you know, a few months ago, right? Where we just spiked pretty much overnight and then faded. This has got some follow through and it may just be a FOMO move across all asset classes. Honestly, when you look at Bitcoin, when you look at NASDAQ, when you look at the S&P, these things are all doing well in tandem, which is extremely unusual. And so at some point that will, <laughs> you know, that has to go like this. And I think that we're perfectly positioned here because of the geopolitical backdrop we have. Like we didn't have that in other rallies. Uh, I don't know of the 70s, but I'm talking in my lifetime in the 2000s. I don't remember outside of 9-11, the obvious, you know, something that was during that decade outside of the 0809 crisis, like that was like, whoa, you know, I mean, right now we could have Russia declare victory tomorrow for all we know. We could have the U.S have a problem with Iran or Iraq tomorrow, for all we know. We have so many things that could ignite that fear trade you're talking about, in my opinion. Right, and I'm actually saying we are going to go into a recession this year, and the stock market is not you know, valued for recession in the slightest degree. I mean, it's at all time highs. So if we start going to, into a recession, which I think we will, I think the stock market is going to start selling off and that's when that fear trade is going to kick in. And, you know, it's amazing to me that everybody thinks that once the Fed lowers rates in June, I mean, that's the target right now, that everything's going to be fine. Lower rates and we're back, you know, the economy is just going to come back to life, you know, and I, I just think that that is such a stretch. I mean, if you look at all the everything that's broken right now, if you think that that's all going to just get healthy overnight just because they lower rates 25 basis points in June, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. So you have a weak housing market right now because we have high, you know, housing prices haven't come down and we have high mortgage rates. I just saw where California just had a, you know, a, just a terrible year in 2023. Um, if you look at the, it was down like over 20%. It's like their, their sales because people can't afford the houses and with these high mortgage rates. So the housing market is, you know, struggling, if you will. Yeah, it lo yeah, I get that. The prices are high, but I don't think those prices are going to high, stay high for long. But I mean, if you're a real estate agent right now, you're not happy. Uh, another one is, is the auto industry. I think the auto industry is getting worse and worse and worse as we speak. It's not improving. It's getting worse. Inventories yes. are going up. D you know, uh, delinquencies are going up. I mean, these things are, these, these are problem, problem. Time, you know, and yet CarMax and Carvana and these stocks are just cranking and you're like, okay, let me call some car dealers. And I have called two car dealers locally that are huge and they're both struggling like big time. So uh, I, I don't, I don't understand the disconnect where if you, if you manage a, a multi, multi-million dollar like franchise like that, um, how that won't bleed into CarMax or Carvana problems down the road or whoever else, right? I'm not trying to single those two out. I'm just saying the astronomical move in some of these share prices. To give you an example, Carvana in December of 22 hit a low of, I think, 353 a share. It's trading over $70 now. I mean, there is so much like speculation in that kind of a move, right? And of course, the price was in the hundreds fell to 350 like it was going out of business and now has rebounded to 70 something i don't follow it every day but like the point is like like to your point the real estate market i've been talking about for well over a year now i'm out like i'm out i own one little house and i've sold the other houses because i don't want to deal with you know selling against my neighbors and the stress of that and i think there's more stress in being a landlord now than more than ever, you know? I don't know if you saw what's happened with Airbnb and all their rules uh, as of last December, but they got kicked out of New York City. They, they're getting kicked out of major cities in Europe, I, I believe like Paris and London this year. They just had a rule that got rid of all internal cameras in rentals. You can no longer have a camera in your house. That's like a rule. So like, these are all gonna drive, um, 
the real estate market into a problem, right? And, and that might benefit hoteliers. I'm not sure, but it's, 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 I think it's going to not benefit anyone. I think that we're going to run in, like you said, a recession, people don't spend five to $700 a night in a hotel and say, whatever, it's fine. Because now you have the money, you might not have the money down the road. And I think that people are going to be pulling in their belts. I remember going through steakhouses, Starbucks, anything where, you know, you have like expendable income, right? Uh, in 2008 and 2009, and it was like ghost towns, you know, there was no one in Starbucks lines, like three people that you go to a Morton's or a Ruth Chris, you have five tables, not 40. You know, it's like people pulled in their belts. Right now, we don't see that, right? You come from a place in Las Vegas where it's always hopping. We both live in the Phoenix metro area here. It's it's hopping. But there are parts of the world that are not so, you know, uh, what's the word? You know, uh, 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 robust. Yeah, right. Um, so, yeah, I just looking at the fundamentals of the economy, um, I just think that they're very it's hard for me to see a path forward where things don't uh, basically break down I mean so we mentioned housing and autos how they're weak right now and it's gonna be hard for them to turn I mean it's not as if interest rates are going to come down three percent this year I mean they might come down you know one and a half percent which isn't just going to ignite these things but then talking about interest rates and loans and stuff like that the banking industry is kind of it's on its on its back right now it's just trying to hold on especially all of your your mid-size and your small banks they're not yep. you know bank sector is weak so i mean when do you have these big sectors in the economy having trouble and everybody's optimistic and the stock market's an all-time the high then you have retail i mean if you look if, i mean if you go and ask like you know, the executives at Home Depot, they would tell you we're in a recession right now. Um, Is that right? Then, and then if you look at the consumer, I mean, the average consumer right now, because of the cost of living increase, has increased so much substantially over the last two, three years, the average, you know, household, their discretionary spending has decreased significantly. I mean, I, I would imagine the average household right now is when they go when they go grocery shopping, they're not happy. They're like, you know, they they're like, what do I'm what can I not buy this time? You know, they're sure. you know, it's not it's not a fun experience right now. And that just gives you an, an example of how things have changed uh, for the worse for you know the average consumer. It's 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 not a positive thing right now, and it's not going to turn. Um, then, and I think this is probably the most important factor, and I think this is where everybody is kind of delusional, if you will, and that's okay. you have GDP growing, basically positive GDP growth. You know, let's say we're at 2% right now, and we have a deficit, a government deficit of $1.5 trillion. I mean, this is insanity. You're not supposed to do that. And it's basically what somebody gave it a term of fiscal dominance. And that's what basically is the term that everybody's kind of using. And what they mean is, is that the reason why the deficit is at 1.5 trillion or higher is because it has to be. <laughs> they can't afford to take it back down to 1 trillion. If they take it down to 1 trillion, the economy crashes. So the economy's in this fiscal dominance where they have to spend money. They're little, literally, it's like QE. It's like the Fed is like pulled money out and the government's like, no, 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 we're going to push it back in. Um, and so, but we're trapped in, we're basically trapped in this fiscal dominance where they can't cut. Now Biden's had this, you know, and, and they keep spending money, printing money. I mean, now the big meme on, on Twitter is that they're spending, you know, every 30 days they're doing a hundred, you know, billion dollars. They're just, you know, it's out of control. One trillion dollars in deficits in the first quarter. That's a f we're on pace for four trillion dollar deficit if they keep spending this much money. And it's mm -hmm. like this is the for me, this is actually the biggest problem for the U.S. economy is this fiscal dominance mm -hmm. problem because they have to borrow so much money, you know, one hundred billion dollars a month or more. And when does that break? And it's never going to break. They can just keep printing it and they can just print and print and print. 
But I think that the markets, the global markets, are going to start to figure it out, if you will. And like you said, you mentioned a few possible black swans and for, you know foreign directed. And I think this is this is the black swan, is that yeah. basically, and what it is is that we are actually going to reach a point once we go into recession. It's when the recession begins. The recession begins, and all of a sudden, liquidity dries up, and the the treasury cannot borrow. $150 billion a month. They can't. Nope. And once once that happens, it's a game changer. And it for, for, for a lot of bad reasons. Because that's when fiscal dominance comes to an end and they have to cut. And that's when it all blows up. And nobody's really thinking about that. That's why I think this is the biggest issue. I think that's true. Um, that's great. That's a great assessment right there. Um, let's pause there because we, we wanted to bring in Jose to have him talk about uh, what's happening in Silver X. And uh, but we, uh, there he is. I, 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 before you come in, Jose, uh, glad to have you. I wanted to make one final point on our macro. And that was you were mentioning in the gold, you know, at 2170, you know, is positive, if you will. And it's an all time high. However, if you go back and you look at history and you look at uh, the actual price of gold, so if you take 800 in 1980, eight, it was $850. So okay. if, you if you adjust that for inflation, it's well over 2,100. It's probably about 3,000. Then if you take yep. the all-time high in 2011, which was 1935, you know, you're up there well over 2500 so 2100 is not really an all-time high it's a nominal high i just wanted to point that out yep no that's a good point i'm, I'm just trying to i like i i get involved like you do don talking to clients on a regular basis and i'm very hands-on and the conversations i've had over the last six to 12 months generally have not been positive right and so i'm trying to just tell people that there's a light at the end of the tunnel here because i can see it looking at the computer screen 10 to 12 hours a day. I'm, I'm seeing bids show up on stocks that were dead in the water. Um, li literally seven, eight days ago, there was no bid. And now there's like 400,000 shares on a junior bid up. And I'm like, wow, okay, someone's buying. And so either that's fund buying, meaning the the, the, the industry funds like my, mining funds, or I think it's more just high net worth, worth, worth retail because you know Jose got to meet one of my clients um, up in Toronto last week, and this is someone who manages a quarter of a billion dollars who basically had no mining experience up to six months ago, who's getting into the space. And that's very encouraging. That's what we need to see more of. We're high right. net worth that are just smart people are saying, hey, this is just ridiculously cheap. Teach me about this. So right. we, are, we are going to get an all time high. I mean, a real all time high, which is going to be you know, way, way higher than we're at now. I just wanted to point that out. Well, three thousand dollar gold, Jose's Silver X is going to crank. <laughs> so this is a very timely interview. Um, sure. Hey, Jose, it was great to see you last week. Uh, nice to see you again, and uh, welcome to the show. Likewise, John. Thank you for having us. And hello, Don. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. I'm 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 ready for the update. This is going to be good. <laughs> I think we're in a in a slightly better market. I was surprised today. Silver X traded about. 1.5 million shares uh, today. So I'm excited. Uh, finally, the market is keeping an eye on us and there's expectations, production, exploration. And I think that's good. It's a good sign that, you know, markets are a little bit more active, put it that way. So there's not yeah. a lot of companies out there that have 150 million ounces of silver equivalent. You know, you're a unique. I, I, I posted a, a list of all the silver miners. You know, you were on it. There's only 21. That's it. There's 21 silver miners. I mean, there's just very few. And and of those 21, there's, you know, they don't all have 150 million ounces of silver equivalent. So you're in a rare, rare group. Indeed. Actually, silver miners, as you say, are very rare. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why when the market changes, you know, tend to be, they, they tend to happen a lot of consolidation among themselves. Uh, I believe that looking at history, uh, what SilverX has in central Peru is a really premier silver district. We produce silver, gold, lead, and zinc. I mean, I was telling my retail investors last week in Toronto, like we have more than 200 veins or 200 exploration targets, and, and we are mining only mining two of those. <laughs> so 
I'm, I'm now trying to tell you that we have a district of proportions and really we've increased our resource like three times since we went public in 2021. And we'll keep on doing that um, without making any statements, but this year you are going to see a resource being updated. And of course, you know, it continues to grow and that's that's amazing news, right? Yeah. But I am I am worried about your company because I, you know, I haven't seen the financials yet to see, you know, it, I mean, as we, I mean, if we look at your balance sheet right now, I know you don't have any debt or you have very little debt, but you don't have very much cash. And the silver price has really constrained you. I mean, the last couple of years has been hard on your company. And so, I mean, so you're one of the companies I worry about because of that, because you're not, you know, when are you going to release your financials? So we'll get, we're going to get the ASIC for Q4. Cause that's, I mean, I think that's a really important number. Yes, I think they will come up in about a month, perhaps less than that, because they have to be audited. So I would say end of March, perhaps beginning of April. Um, I understand your view. I mean, Silverex is a company that raised a very modest amount of money when we went public two and a half years ago. Actually, we raised $13 million, one three, and we built a mine with that money. Uh, and then we've done a couple of small races that were primarily dedicated to covering GNA as a, as a listed company. I think we've done a great job. We build a mine basically with our own revenues. The mine is getting higher speed, or I think we're getting that on track. Uh, back in 2022, we're having an only sustained cost of less than $16. I think that was remarkable. But then we had some operational problems, or more than operational problems, I would call it also planning problems. I think we did the wrong mine plan, but we were uh, transparent enough to admit it to stop the mine and to fix it. So uh, mid last year, around July, I decided to stop the mine, said we're operating at a loss, so we cannot do that for much longer. We stopped for two months, we rationalized contractors, we had to unfortunately slash part of the, of the workforce, but more importantly, we made a plan to target better grade, to have a better, or let's say more productive mine development. So we restarted in late September, so Q4 was OK production, was not spectacular, but certainly better than before. So financials are going to look better, of course. And Q1 production so, is very good, very good. Excellent. So basically, you've been giving guidance of your uh, uh, Tangana mine uh, about at a 2 million ounce AGEQ. That's kind of what you're at. So is that what Q Q4 and Q1 are at? You're basically two. You're basically a, right now a two million ounce AGEQ producer, correct? Yeah, that's in the neighborhood. A little less than that, but next to it. Okay. Okay. okay so. All right. So now that's okay. I mean, you guys got a lot of plans here. You mentioned the exploration potential. Absolutely, it's off the charts. But that's not really the strength of your company. I don't think that's just all blue sky. The strength of your company is taking your 150 million ounces and ramping it up to production. And you have a plan to do that. I mean, on your company presentation, you're showing um, 2026, which isn't that far from now, right? I mean, we're 2024. Yeah. You're showing in your presentation that you're you're targeting 6 million ounces of production, which is a huge jump from 2 million to six million. I mean, it's a huge jump. I mean, if you're a six million ounce producer, I mean, that's that's massive. But I mean, getting there, I mean, you have a PEA and the, it's basically a two step project process. Right. But the first process, the first one is the, is basically jumping, basically doubling your production from two million to four million. That's that's the big one. So you have a PEA on it right now with a 61 million CapEx, $16 ASIC. And I think what you're going to do there is you're going to expand the Tangana mine. Is that correct? The mill? You're going to expand that guy to get to 4 million. Is that correct? Yes. If you look at our resource, I'm going to tell you the three principal ingredients for us to believe that we'll be able to achieve 6 million ounces equivalent within our district, the so-called organic growth. First, we have a good resource. As you said, it's very few companies with 150 million um, ounces of silver equivalent. It, it will continue to grow. And, and more importantly, we are finding areas of, let's say, better grade, which at the end of the day is more profitability. Okay. 
that's great. I think the resource is calling up for an expansion. Now, we are also, other than providing uh, the next resource update, hopefully in Q2, if not in Q2, we'll be in Q3, but I'm touching wood, we'll be able to update the resource in Q2. Also, we are in the final stages of a new environmental impact study. Um, under the Peruvian uh, mining codes, basically you work with environmental agencies to do a new environmental impact study over the last two years, in our case, actually two and a half years, we're in the very end of it. And if we get that approved, okay, we'll get permitted for an additional 1,500 tons a day. That's the PEA you are referring to. So in other words, we'll get a chance to have two mills, 700 tons a day and 1,500 tons a day. When you do your numbers and you put, let's say, a 10 ounce at head grade through that, that's a 6 million ounces, okay? Roughly, okay? That's the vision here. And why is that we can achieve that? Well, we have the team as well. We are producing. That's something I tend to emphasize to our investors. We are producing. And despite being a small mine, we are producing at a competitive cost. You will see Q4. More importantly, you will see Q1. Okay. And the idea here is that if we are able to make money with the small mines, which is my very sort of uh, priority, if you like, then obviously we'll make way more money with a bigger mine. That's, that's evident. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I guess that what we've done over the last year, We've been able to put our head down, focus on production, cost reduction, efficiencies, and demonstrate that we can make money. You, you mentioned a, a second mill. So are you going to build a second mill right next to Tangana? That's a possibility, certainly. You know, the good thing about such a big district is that you get lots of optionality. So we could actually build a new mill next to Tangana or we could wait a little longer and expand the existing mill, okay? It's all an equation of CapEx and OPEX, uh, ability to finance that, uh, you know, I think the good news is that there is optionality. Right, um, so, you know, 61 million, I mean, it's a lot of money. Um, right now, it's hard to raise money. Absolutely, Indeed. very difficult. Um, everybody can tell you that, it's one of the hardest a lot of people will say this is probably the worst time that they've ever seen. I mean, Serato, I mean, it was mind boggling that Serato just lost their flagship project. Um, and all they needed to do is raise about 20 million and they couldn't do it. I mean, it, it's it's kind of, it's mind blowing. So it's tough out there right now. For, so for you to raise 61 million, I mean, you just, I mean, I mean, looking at your numbers, I, I, I'm just confused here. I mean, it's 2024 right now. I mean, in order for you to ramp up, it's going to take, I mean, it's got to be at least a one year build. You don't have a PFS on it. I mean, exactly how in the world are you going to, you know, because again, on your, in your presentation right now, you're mentioning 6 million in 2026. I mean, there's no doubt you can get to get there. I'm just looking at the time frame. So, I mean, how and when are you going to get to 4 million? I mean, that's kind of well, my question. That's a good point. So, Obviously, timing will move depends on markets in general, because you know one thing is to get the permits, one thing is to finance it, as you rightly said. Uh, we can get a project finance, we can get some equity. I do believe that we, we do a good 2024, uh, where the stock price is going to get re-rated big time. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But obviously, if we build a mill, I would aim for a project finance, not for equity, if you like, or perhaps a hybrid. Okay. Now, talking about timing, of course, you know, the timeline is moving, perhaps, because of the slowness of things. But I tell you something, Tangana itself is a mining area. We call it mining units or mining areas. And we've tried to demonstrate with that PA that it can go from the current 2 million ounces to 4.2 on average, with peaks actually about 5 million ounces, but let's say 4, okay? The other 2 million ounces would come from another mining area. It's only a project. It's just different areas. They are adjacent. In this case, we call it plata. Plata means silver in Spanish, right? And we call it plata because it's higher grade of silver. So we like it. We like it and we're going to accelerate that project because it will give us exposure to the silver prices of bigger exposure. Okay. Yeah. That project will produce the other 2 million ounces a year, perhaps even more. Okay. You know, and the good thing is that you are going to have two mining sources feeding the 2 mills. I'd be just interject, Jose. Um, that plata project is adjacent to 
to Ghana? It's all in our district. It's the same okay. district. And, and so that news was out in late February, right? A little Indeed. bit of news on Plata. Indeed. That's a historical mining area uh, where we've been able to reconstruct uh, a resource, let's say internal resource, non-compliant yet, based on historical drilling, underground sampling, and things like that. It's exciting. Obviously, that resource will be put on the desk of, a, of an international uh, qualified person, a QC, and we'll hopefully we'll get that validated in 2024. Okay. Right. Do that resource coming on top. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the potential is off the charts. I mean, we see this. Um, we we see we actually see um, how it's going to unfold over time. Um, you have the resources. It's a matter of how long, how long it's going to take, how much money, and then how much share dilution is going to be required to get there. So as John and I, as analysts, um, we have to analyze and we have to come up with targets, you know, exactly when it's going to happen, you know, how long we're going to have to wait really for the payoff, and then how much dilution is going to be, you know, be acquired. I mean, so right now, and then the timing, so, you know, you, you mentioned that you need the EIS. Once you get the EIS, then you have the PEA. So my first question to you is that you already have the PEA. How much time do you need um, and money do you need to convert that scoping, that PEA, into, you know, ready to build kind of thing? Do you have to do a feasibility or are you, are you going to go straight to fees? Or are you going to build off a of PFS? And then, you know, what what are you thinking there on that? Uh, as you know, in a PA, you can include both measure and indicative resources, but also the so-called mineral inventory, some of the inferred. Uh, when you operate narrow veins, you know, uh, typically companies do PAs because you have three, four years of measure and indicative resources, perhaps even six, seven years, and then some inferred, okay, because it's very obvious. In our case, veins are all outcropping. It's a very evident kind of inferred resource, right? Before moving into construction, we'll do more infill drilling. But the good news is that we are already doing it. We are a mine in operation. So we are continuously drilling it. So the resource, as I said, is getting better recognized. Some of that resource is moving into, let's say, inferred into indicated or measured. Okay. So that's the good news. As we expand the mine underground, we'll get more resources on a fast track. But more importantly, the mine is getting developed. Okay. So when you are talking about building the mine, well, the mine will not be the bottleneck. We'll be building a mill, okay? And the mill is a very conventional flotation mill. Uh, flotation is extremely standard. It's very common. It takes not that long. And by the way, I always need to say that our mining and our processing is very standard. There's no complexity in it, okay? So that's good news as well. Um, but back to your question on when things are going to happen. Well, you know, again, that depends on the markets, you know? If it stops gets properly valued, if there is debt and other financing or alternative financing for, for mining companies, we'll build it quickly. Otherwise, we'll have to wait till the right time. Okay, so is it is it possible that you could get a construction decision this year? You're going to have to wait until 2025. I hope so. Um, according to our predictions, the EIS uh, should be finalized this year or approved, hopefully. And that means that we could make a decision on construction next year. Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, so that would be great. So, I mean, basically, once you get to that point, then you go try to raise the money. Um, and so you really don't need, you know, a lot of money. You shouldn't need a lot of money this year because to build the mill, I mean, it, it's still you're still waiting basically to build the mill. You still have some work to do before you can get to that construction decision. That's correct. So, so this year, um, you know, you this is this is really the most important question you're going to answer today, because we see the path forward. Because you know, I firmly believe that by by the time you get to a construction decision. I think the market will be better and you'll be able to raise the money. Um, yep. So this this is the most important question for you is getting from here to there. So it's like, OK, so, you know, you you know, because you just went through Q4 and you're into Q1, you pretty much know what your ASIC is. You know how much cash flow you're generating. 
um, you're, if you're on your feet, basically, you don't have a lot of debt. So it's just a matter of the cash that you need right now is is kind of, you know, you want you're doing some drilling. You've talked about that. You want to do this infill in drilling. So you want to drill. But as far as su sustaining CapEx, you shouldn't have a lot. So my point is, I mean, are, are you going to be or organically you don't are you going to need to raise money between now and and paying for that mill? That's my question. And if you are going to raise money between now and then, how much are you going to need? How much dilution are you going to do between now and then? OK, that's a good question. Um, even if the I most question any... you're going to answer today. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think that's, that's that's a great question. As I said earlier, we understood that our job was to make the mine profitable. And I think we made the right decisions. It was tough. We had a very rough 2023, okay? Towards the Q4, we're actually more satisfied. I'm, a, I'm sleeping way better now because the team has done a terrific job, okay? So we keep on raising production, hopefully grades as well, and we'll keep on improving our financials. Again, we'll demonstrate the market or to the market that we can make money with the small mines. And on top of that, that we, we grow our resource. With that, I think those are the two ingredients that the market is expecting. Um, yes. Production, profitability with production and resources. Simple as that. I think our story is rather simple indeed. OK, and the moment we are there, we will not need to raise further money. OK, perhaps small amounts for corporate activities. Who knows? You know, I don't have a crystal ball. There'll be opportunities, perhaps M&A. There'll be opportunities, perhaps, to improve the project business improvement at large, and we'll do that, okay? But I don't expect bigger dilution, okay? This year. Backwards. This year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah, that that's, like I said, that's the most important question you're going to answer because for me, um, as an investor, um, the upside for your company, for instance, right now you have 190 million approximately 190 million shares, fully diluted, outstanding. And you're trading at 15 cents. You know, 15 cents is just, you know, it's just. And so if you dilute, if I mean, if you take this thing up to, you know, 400 million shares, 500 million shares, as an investor, I mean, you just, you never, you never crawl out of the hole. You basically stay down there at 10 cents, you know. You can't crawl out. You, you can't. You, so what, as a company, what you need to do, you need to get to a dollar, right? You need to get exactly. to a buck. So, which is easily done, really. I mean, it, as long because you're so cheap right now. It, but the hard part is is getting the momentum going. You know, getting to thirty cents, getting to forty cents, getting the momo going. Um, yeah. And so the way, and you mentioned that your company, you're expecting to get re-rated this year based on performance, right? So in all the only way you're going to do that, I mean, your financials are going to come out into March, early April. Um, they got to show an ASIC, I think, under 18 bucks. If, if you're going to if you're going to pop, you know, go from 15 cents to 20 cents or 20 even higher. Yeah, I mean, if your ASIC is below 18, I think I think that probably is going to do the trick. And then if you if you in tandem with that, if I mean, if you give guidance for the year, have you have you? Have you given guidance for this year for your ASIC? Have you have you done that? Uh, no, I, I wanted to mention a couple of things, Dan. Our ASIC is not going to be $18, okay? Because it was Q4. Don't forget, it's not Q1. Q4 was the moment we're just ramping up again. We're carrying lots of costs. It's not going to be $18, okay? I, I wish it to be. I think Q1 will look a lot better than Q4, okay? okay. So I think, okay. again, we're on the right trend. Um, I think we're going to get re-rated because the moment the market understands and we'll find ways to tell the market that we are improving month after month with production, perhaps indications of development or grades and things like that. So the market will understand that we are perhaps improving month after month. OK, that's my take. But we'll have to be patient because the Q1 financials will not come up until what? Late April, but no, sorry, late May, something like that. OK, so you have to be patient. OK, so you haven't given guidance for 2024 ASIC. We know your no. production. Are you going Bay when are you are you going to when are you going to give guidance for 2024 on your ASIC? Listen, 
we had that discussion internally a number of times and, and within reluctant, I must confess that, uh, to give uh, guidance. We wanted to have a couple of quarters at a decent speed, OK, because as I said, we build the mine with our own revenue. So mines, small mines are a little bit like a roller coaster. You get good months and suddenly bad months, right? Now we're getting a lot of confidence. So I think that later in this year, we're going to provide guidance. Perhaps around Q2, we'll provide guidance for 2024 and beyond, OK? Uh, that's my take, and I will propose that when, when we have the comfort of, of meeting our targets. And I think we're really getting close to that. Okay, so I, yeah, so I said this was going to be the most important question you asked. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's scary. I mean, your, your, your comments are kind of scary. I hate to say it, but they're kind of scary that when you say it's not going to be 18. So if it's not going to be 18, then... Um, Unless silver pops here, I mean, we're at 25 bucks. I mean, if it pops, you know, you get healthy at 26, 27, you get healthy. There's no doubt, right? Yeah. But if, if silver doesn't move, let's say that just between now and when you make your announcement, if silver doesn't move and we're still at 25, um, your share price is not going to go up. It's not going to bounce. I don't know if it's going to go down. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, depends. But here's the key. I mean, and this is why I said it was scary. Um, that tells me that you're out of cash. I mean, if, if you didn't have a good Q4, because you haven't raised any money, and I, I know what your cash balance was, you know, all the way back in September, you got to be out of money. Not really. Okay. Uh, being around, let's say, not a team, but being, let's say, with an all in sustained cause that is break even. Okay. It's, it's great news in the sense that you are not losing any money. Okay. As I said, Q1 is even better. So in other words, it might be, it might be that we are making some cash in 21, okay? In Q1, 2020, 2024, okay? Uh, we are actively looking for other kinds of financing, not necessarily equity, okay? And, and the team is working heavily on that. And I believe we might close something this quarter, okay? And that would be a game changer as well. That's still a mere probability, okay? It's something that is not material yet, but we are working there. And those alternative sources could be either debt or even royalties, okay? So we'll explore every avenue to make sure that we have a good 2024 without looking at significant addition. Do, do you have an NSR right now? I have an NSR on the Tangana mine, okay? We have an what NSR with triple flag. What is it? A 3% NSR with triple flag. Okay. And and you don't have an NSR in Plata? No, we don't. Okay, well that's that's awesome, right? Do a three percent NSR in Plata? Why haven't you done that yet? I mean, that's that's that looks like local hanging fruit to me. It looks to me as well. I mean, we've been slower than than we wished, but you know, that's we, five we'll million get there. bucks. Isn't that five million bucks? I hope it's well, way more than I that. Right, but I mean, right now, today, life of mine, it's about two million ounces. I mean, I would think it's worth at least five million. Maybe, maybe, I mean, aren't you? In, you should be in discussion with these guys. I mean, there's so many, so many of them out there, right? We got about twenty of these royalty plays out there. I would think one of them would be interested. We we are initiating discussions first with our strategic partner, Triple Flag, and then obviously we'll continue with other potential partners afterwards. Right, right. So, I mean, if you put a sweetener in there, I mean, give them some warrants, right? That's a possibility. Also, Plata comes not only with the uh, production uh, in veins, as, as you will, or the underground production, but it comes with some disseminated targets at surface. And I think that's the sweetener, okay? Uh, we never talk about greenfield exploration in our district because our mandate is to be a producer and to make money, right? But right. in the scope of things, when you look at our district, you know, it's really impressive. and it's, very nice or very attractive targets as well for bigger deposits, right? Um, those will come up in the I, near future, not yet. Yeah, I, yeah so, um, yeah, this has been a great, great give and take. I mean, I, I've given you a hard time because there's there's no like doubt that, that uh, there's no doubt that you, your company has, has been challenged without a doubt, right? I mean, $23, $24 silver has been challenging for your companies. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, so I've, you know, I've grilled you pretty hard because of this. I mean, for me, I look at Silver X as a company, a, 
you know, a billion plus. I mean, if you guys succeed, you know, you got as a four, five, six million ounce producer, I see you as a billion dollar company. Your market cap today is 30 million. So the upside is just absolutely off the charts, right? But, you know, one of the things that we do when we interview with people is, you know, we like to let people know the risk reward of these plays, right? I mean, you're basically, you know, your printing is like a 50 bagger. I mean, it's kind of off the charts. However, what happens, the key to it all is financing. It's all about, this is a cash business. You gotta have cash to build mines. You gotta have cash, you know, to stay in business, <laughs> the whole deal, right? So for you, for me as an investor, I want you to get to 4 million ounce production and generate, you know, at least 10 million ounce, $10 million in free cash flow a year. I just want you to stay afloat, right? I want you to stay afloat and then silver prices break out and you break out with it, right? I want yeah. that optionality, yeah. but I don't want you to dilute me into the ground between now and then. Now I get it. You're, you, you management and your company own 17% of your company. You guys, you guys want the upside too. I get that. I like the fact you have skin in the game. And I want to repeat that. Management of Silver X owns 17% of their company. That's a big chunk. So you guys have you have the same, you guys have the same incentive as me. You know, you don't want to dilute yourself into the ground. So I'm hoping in your self-interest, but what but sometimes if you can't raise money, sometimes you get backed into a corner, you don't have any choice. But in order for you, for me, for me to get a 25 bagger out of you, I need you to number one, I need you to survive, and number two, I need you to not dilute me in the ground. I do not want your shares to get to 500 million. Now I'm okay with 300 million. You're at 190 right now. If you stay under 300 million, fully diluted, I'm okay with that. I don't want I you going try, over that. I will try to stay around 200. Uh, let me tell you something. I believe that not only building value, but building trust occasion is like a ladder, you know, step by step. Uh, we understood the market was rough with us because there was concerns about our liquidity, our ability to produce. And that's OK. We understand. That's why we took the risk of being a producer early on. We are going to demonstrate the market. We are good producers. We are good mind builders and we are good explorers. We are going to succeed. Raising money that is non-dilutive money, say debt or royalties, is happening in a second step. We're working on it. That will happen this year. You are talking 15 cents US or 21 cents Canadian. I'll tell you something. If we do a good job this year and this pure speculation, I want to see this at one dollar Canadian. I want to see this one dollar Canadian. And that's production, exploration, and financial stability. Simple as that. It's a very simple recipe. OK, right. yeah. and with a better market, of course, right? If the market continue to be really bad, might not move that much. But I think we're getting into a potential good market or a silver run, at least. I tell you two things just for the last few days. I was surprised I was telling John early on that we've been trading big volumes out of expectations like that. OK, Wait. I don't know why, but people are getting yeah. excited. You're, you're probably the cheapest silver producer out there. You and a, you and Avino are the two cheapest. You're both printing as 50 baggers. That's why people are I, interested. I, I love Avino too. I love it. So right now there's three companies out there that this is kind of a make or break year because once you kind of get above, once you get beyond it, um, get through this difficult part, right? Um, you guys are just, just I'm just going to blast off. And the three companies, well, there's actually four. Uh, I, I would, but the, the four companies, I think this is kind of a make or break year. They need to get through it. Now, not a make or break year for survivability, a make or break year for an investor, for me, mm -hmm. my upside. My upside doesn't get diluted into the ground. And those companies are Santa Cruz, who basically has a whole bunch of debt coming due in one year. The other one is Hummingbird. They got a whole bunch of debt coming due next year. So they have to get through this year without diluting because they have that overhead debt. Yourself and Guanajuato. And the reason why you guys are risk for investors is because you just don't have any cash. You don't have enough. And, and the price of silver is just killing you guys. So if we get through this year, those four companies – and I don't know which one will get hurt and which one won't. You, and that's why I say it's kind of scary. If you get through this year and silver prices go, and I think silver prices will, if we end this year at $27 silver, 
you're suddenly, you're golden, you're good. You're like, hey, we can generate free cash flow. We can build this company. We're off to the races, right? You, you basically, the road is cleared. You guys are off to the races. So I'm saying this is kind of a kind of a make or break. But on paper, I mean, if you look at your company on paper right now, it's still kind of, you know, still a little bit sketchy. It's not a slam dunk yet. You, like I said, if you go and raise five million in that royalty, with triple flag gives you five million, or somebody else gives you five or five or more than five, that really solidifies the risk reward for me. But I mean. I mean, right now, I got to believe you don't have much cash. I got to believe you got less than a million bucks in the bank and you're just like, oh, God, what's going on? I mean, as a person, you never want to be low on cash, right? That's a bad thing. So right now you're like, oh, God, what's going right. on here? You're yeah, right. right. And that's, that's the story of our yeah. life. We never had much cash in the bank and we're able to build mines and to survive. But you're absolutely right. But that's going to get fixed. That's going to get right fixed on. with production and with financing. Hey, I always uh, grill the CEOs when we get interviewed. That's my style because uh, <laughs> the, the people the people that follow me, you know, they want to know what my opinion is on these companies and, you know, what is the risk reward? Is it a total slam dunk? How much risk is there? You know, um, we saw with Serato. I mean, Serato looked like a beautiful investment. It went south. So these things are not always slam dunks. But like I said, man, sure. this is the make yeah. or break year for you. Or Thanks for your time. They, they turn out to be like marathon, where you know we don't get our payday because now gold's breaking out and they sold the caliber, right? So like we want someone like Jose's team that owns seventeen percent of shares. Jose, you were telling me last week that you own a couple million shares yourself, right? No, actually, I own uh, with including including my parents, but 15, 15 million shares myself. Fifteen, 15 okay. one five. Uh, and, and and Sebastian Val, co-founder, owns a similar amount. And we also have another insider and institutional uh, money, which is uh, Baker Steel out of England, and they own about 12% of the company. Uh, so in other words, I'm telling you that almost a third of the stock is with insiders. And if you add some of the other institutions like US Global, for instance, and, and some other smaller funds, I believe that we might get, I don't have the data, but we might get close to 40% of, let's say, investors that will not be selling silver eggs. Okay. All right. I think, um, I, I'm not looking at your deck right now, but that would be a great pie wheel to update uh, at some point this year because Don and I continually talk on this show about, you know, having at least 30% tied up so that we don't see a marathon happen, right? Because we just, you know, as investors, we go through too much to get to, Oh gosh, you know I'm gonna bail here. You don't strike me as that kind of guy, and and I didn't, I don't know anything about the marathon CEO. I can't speak for him, but I know we got three million bucks to do that deal. So you know, are there any incentives for you to sell? I don't think there are, but are there? No, not really. And I actually have a good amount of options. And just so you know, my options are mostly at sixty cents. Okay, okay. and I, Canadian. Everything I say is Canadian. Sorry, and and I'm gonna make money with that. And our each options, I think we have about 7 million options outstanding, mostly with management, directors, and things like that. And average price is 45 cents. We have about 14 million warrants, approximately. Average strike price is 39 cents. Okay. Hmm. Uh, okay. And I do believe, honestly, that we might be back in those high 30s or 40s. Again, this is pure speculation, but I think we could be back there in, in, in weeks. The key, okay. Right. The key's gonna, the, yeah. yeah. The key's going to be dilution. If you don't have to dilute, then yeah. But if you do dilute, that it puts a lot of downward pressure on the stock price, right? So, but like I mean, you said, um, you're right now, right now you're working on uh, debt financing and royalty financing, which is non-dilutive. So that would be very, very beneficial to shareholders. Let me just uh, chime in because I, I mean, Jose, you're talking, you know, getting to that 60 cent level. Personally, that's a goal for you with options at 60 cents. So, you know, you, you mentioned a dollar earlier, you know, on a 12 month look out. Don, you were saying, you know, hey, the ASIC's got to be X, Y, Z for this stock to go from little under 15 US to 20 US. I have a little bit of a different take than both of you in that if you look at the US chart, uh, the ticker's AGXPF. Look at that over a three-year chart, and you'll see it's holding 11 to 12. Every time it gets to that level, it bounces. 
And um, right now we're trading slightly under 15, but I think part of the problem on the share price right now is it's not just Don that may be thinking you need some cash. It's some other participants in the market just waiting and seeing, right, Jose? So like, it's not like there's some problem. It's just that part of the junior mining is is raising cash. Where, you know, you have to continually do this on every nine to 12 months. And maybe that's what is happening here. Some people are gaming the stock, but like that's a mistake because of the things you saw today with silver just blowing up three plus percent on no news. It, it, it has a mind of its own. And so when, when silver cranks past 26, which I think is going to happen, um, then you're bringing in a test of 30, which would be surprising to most people, right? So like, this is the time, like I say this over and over again to my clients, you can't get too cute with the entry price. You just got to buy some and you have to buy in, in, in waves. If you don't want to put all the money to work now, I suggest buying two to four times. You know, I buy six times roughly on average because I'm not perfect. I don't know what the exact correct entry price is. You know, uh, obviously in listening to you with options way out of the money right now, you know, it's like you've got an incentive to get there. And that's really positive. I think your comments are spot on. Yes. Well, I, um, yeah, I, I just want to say something about valuation. I mean, the reason why they're valued at 30 million is because investors are, are concerned about their profitability. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Um, oh. you know, if, if they're not profitable, you know, nobody wants to own it. And then the risk, the risk really goes up, right? So it's if you're not if you're not making money, um, you know, in silver miners, you're just going to get you know you're really going to get hammered, unless you're a stronger company if you're a little bit bigger. But if you're a small producer and you're not making money, you're going to get just absolutely annihilated, and they've been annihilated. But the same token goes exactly what you're saying. This year, if we start showing profitability, our share price is oh. definitely going definitely going to reflect it. And I couldn't agree more. And you're right. I mean, getting to 60, 70 cents Canadian this year is very, very doable. You start showing some, if you show that you're making money. And that's our job. We are focused 100% on that. We'll get it done. That I can promise. We are going to make money with this district. That's something that the team is so enthusiastic about. And we're going to do it. I'm not asking for two years patience. I'm asking for a few weeks or a few months, right? Right. Uh, because we are getting there. Well, you put five, you put five million cash in the bank, and you don't dilute. I'll, I'll add some shares. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in closing, Jose, um, could you just talk a little bit about what we talked about last week with regards to Peru as a jurisdiction? Because you live there, um, you know what's happened with Castillo over the last fifteen months. I see Peru as a really great value proposition right now because silver and copper are just, it, it's heavily produced in that region, right? So could you talk a little bit about what your thoughts are? Indeed, that's a great question because I typically get asked that when I go to North America, right? And they understand Peru is, is a relatively small South American economy, far from the big countries like Canada, US or Mexico, right? But reality is that despite the political turmoil, Peru has been a mining country forever and will keep on buying. It's the quintessential mining country. So, you know, there's never been a discussion on nationalization of assets. I get asked that question. There's never been, mm -hmm. even with socialist governments at all. OK, there has been political turmoil or instability. Yes, it is. However, look at the macroeconomic numbers of Peru. On a compounded basis, the inflation rate is actually, actually over the last few years, lower than the U.S., by the way. OK, the exchange rate with the US dollar has been very stable over years, always 3.3, 3.6 uh, national currency that new sold with the dollar. And overall, in terms of the mining code regulation and a skill for, uh, let's say, workforce available in the country, I told you Peru is still one of the best jurisdictions in the Americas to do mining. I'm not saying we are Nevada. We might be second after Nevada. And I tell you what. We already built two small mines in this district. We'll keep on building mines in this country forever. That's my take. Great. Yeah, thank you. I, I, wanted, I wanted to add one thing because I don't think uh, viewers know this about Jose, but Jose is a young CEO. This is his first company, but I've talked to Jose a couple of times and he hasn't mentioned this, 
But Jose is actually a very ambitious guy. This mine, he's already he's already been on the lookout for deals where he could acquire properties. This is, yeah, we haven't talked about this at all in this interview, but Jose is a guy that wants to build a big company. In other words, he, this, he's, he's already been on the lookout. He almost bought Arcana's mine. He was on the ground there. He went there twice. He looked it over. He actually put in an offer for the thing. So yeah. he wants, he, and he's looking, he's always looking. So I guarantee you, this is not their last mine. This is not their last district. If, if Jose's successful here, once he gets on his feet, he's going to go buy another company. As a matter, as a matter of fact, he won't he won't hesitate. He is a, that type of a guy. He's very aggressive. He wants to be, he, he wants to build something big. I just want people to know that about him. And Jose, <laughs> talk, you know, talk about that. How you're you're basically already looking for M and A deals. Uh, with it in the past, there was there were better conditions. The market was not so gloomy. Um, we thought that at some point we are going to get really appreciated in the market when we do our homework. We have a, a great team of explorers, an amazing team of miners. I think we're extremely proud of what we can do here in Peru in terms of mining underground veins, doing it fully mechanized in a, in, a, in a safe way and a level of profitability or let's say performance that many other companies couldn't compete with. So the moment we demonstrate that to our investors, that we have that competitive edge, will be the one that acquires company, not the one that gets acquired. That's our dream. We'll make sure that we walk on solid grounds. But the moment we have a good 2024 and I'm placing all my bets on that, yes, we'll be looking for growth, whether it's organic or inorganic. As long as it's accretive to you as investor, we'll do it. Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure, Jose. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on and sharing all this with us. Just really detailed information and there should be more people um, we, we try very hard, you know, once a month to, to find people like you that are willing to share stuff that, you know, is public information, but, you know, also digging deeper into the public information because it's important. Uh, not right. everyone, you know, has the time to to look at things like Don and I do. And um, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing all this with us. You know, I appreciate your time, John. It's really amazing to, to be talking to you and, and to Don as well. I've been following Don also for a number of years. I like being grilled. Like this, I think it's good. It's good for us, good for investors. It brings a degree of transparency. Um, and I, I like that. I think we are in a risky business, but certainly we are a company that can create a um, you know, terrific amount of value over the next few months. So keep an eye on us. We'll not disappoint you. So I, can... I, I had one follow up. So uh, nobody's acquired Arcana, it's just been sitting there. So I mean, no, it's, is been that acquired. Still... it's been acquired by a private company. Oh, private. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, good to know. Okay. Sure. Well, Jose, right. thank you again. And um, Don and I are just going to talk for a few minutes, just uh, wrapping things up here. So I'll talk to you again next month. Know. Yeah, we'll do it again yeah. in six months or nine months. Okay. You'll be calling me before that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Hey, we're on WhatsApp, me and you, Jose. You just text me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jens. Have a good time. Right. See you. That was good, Don. Yeah, um, we saw the potential there. I mean, the potential is absolutely incredible. Um, it's going to be interesting. You know, that interview, I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see what unfolds with Silver X over the next six, nine months. It's going to be really interesting because there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, this isn't this company is not a slam dunk. I mean, Jose, you know, he tells he talks a really good, you know, story, and it, it's a good. It is, you know, a strong, you know, potential is off the charts. But right. like I said, right now, uh, this is a make or break year for them, and there's a lot of risk. They have to get through this year. They got to raise some money. I, I know that um, that their bank account is not very. <laughs> it's not strong at all, and mm -hmm. so I mean. If they're not generating a profit, and I, you know, they, it's got to be kind of a hit and miss situation for them right now. So they got to raise money, and so we got to see, you know, how they raise it, what happens. But this is yeah. an ugly market to be raising in. 
I mean, if they went out there right now and tried to raise like three million in equity, their their share price would go back, go down to eleven to twelve. Yeah, I mean, I think as you brought up, there's an opportunity on Plata for some type of royalty deal. Um, I just that would be obvious, and I think with Jose's fifteen percent ownership, and I know Sebastian is number two very well. He's got 15% ownership. When you when you the two guys running the ship have 30% of the float, they don't want to dilute us into oblivion, you know. And that's very positive because they're not going to become a four to five hundred million share operation uh, unless silver goes back to 18 to 20. I mean, none of right. us can predict that, right? I mean, but right. I, I really feel when you look at the silver price, it's been pretty constructive. We held 20. We held 21, yeah. and then this year we've held 22 pretty nicely. Right, but the thing about their um, holdings, they, they, he actually said 15 million shares they both have. I think I think it's 17 percent total. Okay. 15 million, right? It's 15 million plus options, but their holdings are so large, if you will, that they can afford to take a pretty big hit just to keep the company alive. So. For instance, when they go to build that mine, so it was the capex was 61 million to build that mill. Right. Um, it's very possible that could slip. Let's just say 65, 70 million, and yep. they might not. Well, a lot of times banks will not allow you to borrow the full thing. They make you to do equity as well, sure. and they make in a lot of that equity is they want you to raise some cash. They want cash on your balance sheet, right? So in order for them to put, you know, let's say that they borrow 40 million, if they had to do an equity raise of 20 million, um, depending on what their valuation would be, that could be brutal for shareholders. That's why I'm saying. Yeah, no, I get it. I I just don't see Jose doing that unless his back was really against the wall next year, because as we've established, this is not a 2024 decision, right? It's a 2025 decision decision mm-hmm. and i think silver's at 30 bucks in 2025 don't you i mean that's that's the thing where then you're going to get i believe a lot of I, I mean i'm being contacted more and more by private equity and hedge funds than i've ever been contacted with since 2020 i had a lot yeah. of interest from them then now it's come back in the last like week to two weeks so that's yeah. really bullish because these guys can deliver a million here three million there like they're they see some of these companies, a small percentage, see the opportunity. At $30 silver, you're going to have 5x the company seeing the opportunity. Oh, I yeah, I couldn't agree more. The, the, the risk reward is really starting to improve and people are starting to see it. I mean, we've been in this business a long time and we're seeing this is, this is the, the third run. I mean, you had the 70s and you had the 2000s and now we're, we're getting ready to, to begin that third one which is, you know, I think this is going to be, you know, the biggest one of all, them all. And mm-hmm. the reason why is because this one's going to occur when the entire world, the debt bubble's popping, and gold's going to transition from something that's used for insurance as something that's used for making money. It's actually going to be a, an asset that people are chasing to make money out of. It's like, okay, I want to own silver because it's going up. Now, I'm, people aren't going to go be buying like the retail crowd, they're not going to go in there and start buying silver at 35 bucks because they're afraid of inflation. They're going to buy it at 35, 40 bucks because they want to make money. And yeah. I think that's I what's think happening gold, with Bitcoin right now. Yes, right? gold, silver, and Bitcoin. There, people are going to be all chasing FOMO, making money. It's like I want to own this because it's going higher, and that's why you're getting these calls. But mm-hmm. I do think that I do think it's when 60. The sixty million dollars um, capex, sixty to seventy million capex, I that that definitely is going to be. So for me, I don't want to see dilution prior to that. Yeah. If, if I was if I was totally confident that there was going to be no dilution between now and capex, I'd be adding shares here, because it. I mean, yeah. it's fifteen cents U.S. I'd be adding shares. Sure. Um, and and if, and I told and what I said to Jose is that if you if you go out there and do a royalty deal and put five million bucks on your balance sheet, I'm adding shares. But my concern right now is if they have to do a financing prior to the capex, like this year they raised money, and then they got to do that financing of that capex, and then they and then 
you know, he goes over to that 300 million mark, you know, and puts pressure. Um, you know, all could be well. I, I'm looking at I'm looking at worst case scenarios here, by the way. I'm, um, yeah. yeah. And I, think they, I think they probably will have to do a raise at some point this year. Um, I just don't think it's going to be large because what I'm seeing, I don't know if you see the same trend, trend on, but companies, the smart guys are not doing the seven to $10 million plus raises right now. They're doing a million to 4 million, right? Somewhere in that range. I got to survive this year, but I see yeah. prices are escalating. So I'm not going to dilute the heck out of shareholders. And that's a good thing because I preach this all the time to CEOs. You don't want to redo your shareholder base. Like that is, a, it's always amazing to me how people don't understand this. They they want to it's, stand at a booth and, and right. collect business cards, people coming to them. You need to take care of the people like us that have been in the stock, right? Like that's, we, we have influence, you and I, right? Like there are other people in our sector that have the same influence. And if we get wronged, then thousands of other people that follow us are going to say, okay, well, hey, John and Don think like X, Y, Z. So you know, we're, we're spending the time to do this. I mean, I met with 21 CEOs in Toronto last week, which you and I could talk about, you know, when we get together March 28th with Treasury Metals. But like the, the sentiment is interesting because the CEOs that are sharp, like Jose, they see the path, but the other ones are like head and hands. It's really like, um, uh, it's like a tale of two <laughs> stories right now where, where it's like some of these guys are still bullish like Jose and some of them have given up. And I'm not gonna, you know, put capital into companies that that are giving up here. Like, I mean, there's this is the time you hunker down, figure it out, and get to a better place. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I said. That's why I meant the next six nine months are really going to be a tell on, you know, on how this company is going to unfold. Um, we're gonna we're gonna find out a lot. Um, you know they're probably going to give more guidance. They're going to they're going to tell us what they're. We're going to find out. Like right now, we don't know what their ASIC is in in 2024. We're probably sure. going to find out sometime. You know maybe late May. They said he said Q2. It Actually, might go to said, June. Um, I think he said April for ASIC. financial. Okay, financial. April, March, April for financials, but the guidance not until Q2. Oh yes. Correct. And it, it's going to be May June. He wants to get. He basically wants to get more confident. Yeah. Um, maybe the middle of Q2, he'll, he'll they'll give guidance. Um, that'll be really important. That'll be a really important number. Um, well, look, we so, need to string. We need to string together a few more days like today, right? Up three uh, point whatever percent in silver, and you string together some of those days leading, let's say, over the next couple of weeks. I mean, we've got the Fed March 20th, right? That's a that's a nothing mm -hmm. burger right now. That's a 4% chance right. of, of a cut that's not happening. Uh, no. So it's just, you know, looking at what Fed had, the Fed has to say about the recent, you know, economic data and what May 1st and June 12th look like, because that's what really is important here. This is a nothing meeting. It's, it's May 1st is gone from a 90% probability of a cut to 20 something percent. That's now possibly off the table in my view, probably is off the table. So now we're looking yeah. at June, and if June yeah. doesn't happen, like the broad market, I think, is going to start getting really, really frustrated, and you're, you'll start seeing more banks under pressure. You'll start seeing real estate under pressure. Like this is just going to happen. It's I, you can't. Really I, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I'm I'm expecting an, I'm expecting a crash, but I don't think it'll happen all at once. So so what I'm thinking is going to happen is the market just slowly rolls over. So we're like we're almost at 5200, S&P is almost at 5200 right now. So yep. once it drops down to like let's say 4800 in that area, that's when it's going to be kind of a make or break time where the market either bounces or continues to slide downward. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm waiting for I want to see around 4800 before I think that's going to be kind of the area where things start to really turn, where people start to get actually more interested in gold, if you will. Um, yep. It's like, okay, which way this market's going to go? It's really weird. Gold is acting really strange right now. Gold is actually going up with the markets. Historically, yep. gold and the economy are nemesis. They're the opposites. Yeah, totally Strong agree. economy, don't need any gold. So right now we got 
a so-called strong economy, which I don't think it is, which is the reason why gold's up, and you have the stock market up and gold up at the same time. I think that uh, the stock market is the poser here. That's the fake, that they're the poser. Gold's the real deal. Gold is high because of the uncertainty, all these underlying things. However, when the, that market starts to come down, gold will come down with it. But gold will say, wait a minute, I'm not the poser, you are. And gold will start going back up. Right. And that's what's going to happen here. Um, so I don't think that gold is running. I think gold right now is in a technical trade. Just it's the everything market. It's basically just, you know, real estate's up, gold's up, market's up. It's like the everything bubble kind of thing. And, but gold's not just going to just take off here because there's no underlying driver. There's no fear trade where everybody has to have gold, right? Wall Street's not buying gold. If you look at the GLD, the GLD's shrinking, right? The GLD. GLD. I heard about that in my newsletter. Yesterday, so it's like, it's like, the reserves it's, it's, have been shrinking every month, right? You and I have talked about that, and uh, same with IAU. Um, and 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 what happens when, you know, I, the only time I can remember back in 2016, probably October, when IAU couldn't deliver gold on that one Friday on the front cover of the C section of the journal, and it it may have happened between that, you know, then and now, but. It's, it's something that obviously a lot of our peers talk about happening and maybe this time it will happen and that's going to ignite more fear and more of a crisis of confidence. Right. I, and what you brought up earlier, I think is really spot on. You, you talked about all of these foreign global, uh, basically black swans that are all kind of emerging. They're all kind of bubbling yeah. up, right? Where the U.S. economy is, is tied very strongly to what's going on globally, you know, the U.S. dollar and you know the global South, what's happening there, where people are moving away from the dollar, and then you have all these the energy crisis that's kind of happening right now. You know, with the Middle East, we got the war in Israel. We got you know, is uh, Russia's under sanctions. And, you know, it's there's a lot going on internationally. And I, I think that is really in the dollar. I just think that people are really. Um, thinking that you know the dollar's always been this you know this you know this very this strong currency is going to stay strong. Um, I, I just think that's the wrong take. I think the dollar is in in deep trouble here. Once the recession begins, mm -hmm. the recession begins. They cut they cut rates. The dollar drops, um, and I think that's what we're going to see here unfold. That first cut when they make that first cut. I think the dollar um, is going to go down, and I don't think it's going to recover. And I think gold's going to pop. I think, um, so I, I think that first cut is what we really need to wait for, for the yeah. breakout, for the and, real and breakout. That's most likely June now. I'd say. Um, I, I just I'm not in the camp of May first, uh, and that's way longer than uh, we were expecting, just based on November December Fed speak. So we'll see. But we got to wrap it here. Um, Don, March 28th, you and I will interview Treasury Metals, Jeremy Wyeth. I'm excited for that. Um, three million ounces, three million ounces of gold in Canada just sitting there and uh, not getting much love from the market at all, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, so, like to hear Jeremy's thoughts and see what uh, what's going on there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've spoken with them before. It's a really good story. Um, and it'll be a good conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again, Don, for everything as usual. Uh, always a pleasure. And um, I'll talk to you in two weeks. All right, John. Thanks, everyone. This is John Fennick with the Fennick Commodities Report. You'll have my contact info on the, on the tail end of this. And feel free to send me an email. Uh, I'll be advising a conference April 29th and 30th in Washington, D.C., uh, which is the first time I'm an advisor to a mining conference, and I'll be speaking there twice. Um, so if any of you are interested, it's going to be downtown D.C., April 29 and 30. Contact me for discounts or for free admission. Uh, I'd be happy to try to help any of you. Thanks a lot. Have a good one.